thank you. That was a lovely introduction, and I'm so, can you all hear me? Okay, um, I'm, I'm so pleased to be invited, Roy. Thank you for inviting me to Waterloo, because for many years, um, I've known this as a hotbed for hydroecological research. Many of my favorite scientists either came from here or just arrived here or have been here for some time. So it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I, I don't normally start my talks with, and you're never supposed to start your, start your talks with an apology. Um, what I'm going to talk about at, at, at the invitation here of Roy is the International Nitrogen Management System that you see here. And, and I'm something of a carpetbagger to this group, which is an American expression for someone who shows up and, and has no real expertise. Um, as Roy mentioned, I am a biogeochemist. I'm an ecosystem ecologist. Most of my work is done in this particular watershed, which is Lock Vale in Rocky Mountain National Park. We now have 40 years of continuous data where we started out looking for, it turned out acid rain, but it, it ended up being nitrogen deposition. So I have backed into nitrogen management issues through looking at how it affects remote, pristine areas far from their sources of, of, of nitrogen pollution. So as I talk about this, I am no expert, and I would welcome discussion as we go through, but what I want to do is talk to you about this really exciting four-year project that both Roy and I are involved in, and a number, actually hundreds of other people around the world, um, trying to develop nitrogen policy based on a foundation of science that can be used at a global scale, a national scale, and a regional scale. And there's one other thing I need to say, although there are not a whole lot of undergraduates in the audience, I had a mentor years ago, I was in my 20s, who said, you know, every 10 years you ought to change direction and do something you're slightly uncomfortable doing. So I'm real comfortable working up in this lake looking at nitrogen dynamics and in the soils, but moving into re national and international nitrogen policy, that was my uncomfortable switch. And I recommend it for everybody because you learn so much. And it, and it also is a humbling experience because it tells you things about yourself that you should know and don't. So I'm going to start with a couple of quotes. Um, these come from the UN Environment Report just last year in 2019. And the, the godfather of this whole international nitrogen management system project that we're involved in is Mark Sutton. So this is a quote from Mark Sutton. Um, and it came out in this 2019 report. And it says the UNEP 2014, so five years before, the UNEP UNEP 2014 yearbook highlighted the importance of reactive nitrogen in the environment. Its conclusions are alarming. This is not just because of the magnitude and complexity of the problem, which you all know very well, but because so little progress has been made in reducing it. He goes on to say, few of the solutions identified have been scaled up, while the world continues to produce nitrogen pollution that contributes significantly into, and you know these as well as I do, declines in air quality, deterioration of terrestrial and aquatic environments, exacerbation of climate change, depletion of the ozone layer. So that's the urgency with which we are approaching nitrogen as a global management issue with this international nitrogen management system. And it's, um, I might have mentioned this already, it's a four-year program. Um, we're in our third year out of four, and we're coming into having exciting conclusions overall. So these next several slides will be things you've already seen and know about, I imagine, having been at the University of Waterloo. But this is a trend in emissions over the past century from 1900 up to about 2015. And you can see that along about mid-century, 1950, 1960, when the Haber-Bosch industrial process kicked in, we saw an exponential increase in nitrogen fertilizer production and application on the world's surface. And that trend continues to this day with no sign of abatement. You also can see nitrogen oxide emissions. That's the orange line there. Um, it also ramped up since the beginning of the 20th century, again, increasing somewhere around mid-20th century. But since about 1990, 1980 on this graph, 1990, where I do my research in Colorado, nitrogen oxides have actually been holding a little steady, if not even decreasing. And that's because we're actually switching over in many of our sources from fossil fuels to alternative energies. Our automobile fleet is cleaning up. Nitrogen oxides, potentially within 50 or so years, could be a thing of the past, uh, which would be a wonderful thing. You could also see an increase in the bottom here of, of biological nitrogen fixation. Again, as we try to feed 7.x billion people on this earth, 
these are the kinds of, of things that produce more cropland, more productivity, more yield as we, we go through. So our nitrogen problem, as I just said in that quote, is not going away. If you look at where it's happening on the landscape, um, you see the usual suspects. So developed and, and highly industrialized and agricultural parts of the world, such as Western Europe and North America, Canada and the US, you see excess nitrogen. Basically, the warmer the color, the more nitrogen that is being produced and applied to our croplands and the more nitrogen that is actually being released to the environment as a pollution. So you look at Western Europe and you look at North America, but you also look at countries that are coming on and developing their capabilities to produce ever more and more food. And those especially are China and India, where they're producing, where they're, where they're applying nitrogen far, far in excess of what's actually needed because they want to grow more food. And those are areas where nitrogen is being released in tremendous amounts to the environment. So these are inputs happening all over the world. There are still places on the planet where nitrogen is still limiting to food security. Sub-Saharan Africa is the most um, visible example of that, but there are pockets all over. And, and so areas that are green do not have enough nitrogen. Some of those, it's OK. Natural systems should not have more nitrogen than planned. But Sub-Saharan Africa is an example that we use in INMS where you can't say pollution is everywhere. This is area that is still food insecure. So the kinds of effects are, are these, and I have to apologize. I made this figure, and, and it's even too detailed for me. But let me talk you through it. Again, I suspect that you know much of this overall. Let me start with the green circle down there. That's the good stuff. That's why we apply nitrogen to our landscapes in order to grow more food, to grow more biomass. What do you get out of it that's good is you get increased crop yield. You get um, carbon sequestration, often as a byproduct. You get forest growth when you add nitrogen to these systems. But the downside of that is nitrogen leaches out and causes freshwater and coastal pollution. If you move up, um, you're looking at, at atmospheric uh, gases and aerosols that are being put into the atmosphere and transported some distance away. Those are mostly causing negative impacts. You see particulate matter formation, which has a climate change function. It also is harmful to human health. You see acid rain. You see atmospheric ammonia, which can be toxic to plants when it's in high enough concentrations. And you see nitrogen deposition, which is how I backed into this project in the very beginning. If you go over to the yellow circle, nitrous oxide formation contributes both to depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer. That's a serious threat to human health, as well as, as um, other types of organisms all over the world. And it also, of course, is a potent greenhouse gas. I just said that word. There's too many uses of it for nitrous oxide. Um, moving down into brown, you get ozone formation and nitrous oxides. And this is what often comes out of tailpipes, uh, emissions from power plants and industrial facilities. It contributes to smog. And at least where I'm coming from in the western United States, that smog amount is increasing because we have increasing oil and gas production, um, which is not well enough controlled. Smog is damaging the human health. You also have vegetation damage from ozone. Um, you have heat trapping gases when you get ozone uh, layers along, along the tropospheric, in the troposphere. And then if you move down to the blue, which is where many of us are most comfortable looking at water quality, you get nitrate and ammonium leaching in from either agricultural activities, atmospheric deposition, all kinds of sources. As that comes in, it causes freshwater and coastal pollution, causes groundwater pollution, these are the effects that we're all working to try to minimize as you go from the good stuff, which is growing more food, to this kind of thing. So just a little bit of history of how this became sort of a, a policy issue, which it certainly is and needs to be. Um, many of us have made our careers studying nitrogen biogeochemistry, partly because it's really interesting. Nitrogen is not like sulfur. Nitrogen has a million different forms, and it goes a million different places, and it circles around back and forth. But it's also, because of all the reasons I just mentioned, it should be a huge national and international policy issue. So this fellow down here is Jim Galloway. We credit him with being the father of this whole idea of, let's not just study it, let's try to do something about it. He started what's called the International Nitrogen Initiative. And I think this year is our 25th anniversary. Um, there's a meeting in Berlin coming up in May of this particular year, INMS 8. And INI8. Um, it's a volunteer organization. There's no money involved. There's no real 
structure and function, but it brings people together from all over the world to try to develop innovative ways of understanding nitrogen and then trying to develop policies in order to, or at least suggest policies, excuse me, from a basis of science um, from which better management can, can take place. So he, the mantra for INI is optimizing nitrogen in use, use in food and energy production while minimizing the, the harm. And he says, and I agree, nitrogen is a solution. It should not be a problem. It certainly should not be the problem it is today globally. So from this came Mark Sutton, who's at CEH in Edinburgh. Um, Mark is the mastermind behind actually taking INI and turning it into a huge global program that Roy and I are involved in. As I mentioned, literally hundreds of people from all over the rest of the world. He wrote a proposal, and I kid you not, it's at least 880 pages long, that went to the UN Environment Program. It was funded by Jeff, the Global Environment Federation, to bring scientific evidence together to inform policies and the public on the multiple benefits and threats of reactive nitrogen. So in addition to studying it, in addition to trying to develop small-scale communication approaches to change people's minds, He's gone directly to the largest international body he could find and say, OK, we're going to inject <coughs> nitrogen science into everywhere in the UN where it's possible to manage it, and we're going to make that stick. He's actually been very successful at that. I'm going to end my talk with a couple of slides about what's happened in the past three to four months, thanks to INMS and thanks to Mark Sutton. But let me talk to you just a little bit, and I promise it's a little bit about structure. <coughs> Roy alluded to this. Excuse me. <coughs> you called them pillars. I like that better than components. Um, there are four pillars to this four-year program, and we are three years into it. All of them are designed to provide science and a scientific foundation for making better, better decisions. So it, it comes to the realm of policy, but it doesn't actually interact with and, and recommend different policies. So the first one is this one called Tools and Methods for Understanding the Nitrogen Cycle. And, and I am actually in charge of that, along with a colleague of ours, Hans van Grinsman, out of the, Univers out of the Netherlands. Um, it's developing a basis, and I'll go into this in, the, in a second. Um, I'll come back. It's developing a basis of scientific knowledge that can be used for these other pillars up here. So the darker green pillar is global and regional quantification of nitrogen flows. It's a bunch of models. It's very interesting. There's about eight or 10 models all operating at a global scale, looking at different aspects of nitrogen budgets, nitrogen fluxes, um, nitrogen impacts on different sectors of society, again, at a very large scale. And those, there's an arrow going from, from the first pillar to the second pillar because they're relying on the methods that we produce that will give them credible data, both as inputs to their models as well as credible data that can be used for validation for those models. And that's moving along very well. Component three, or pillar three, down here in blue, are regional demonstration projects. And I'm going to come back to that because we have one here in North America that I'm very involved in. I think it's very exciting. And I want as much advice from you as I can get out of it. And the last part of it is actually raising awareness at a, at a global and national scale. I'll end with that over time. But let me unpack a little bit of this first light green box. It has. Um, and I promise this is the last one of these sort of wiring uh, diagrams you're going to see. Um, it has six components to it. The first one is indicators. And I am going to go into a little bit of detail about that in the next few slides. Because these are indicators that we've decided, or someone decided, we will apply to all the demonstration projects around the world. So the first is developing national nitrogen budgets. The second is looking at farm budgets, since so much of the reactive nitrogen problem worldwide comes at the agricultural level. Um, yes, there are these other sources, but agriculture is by far the largest problem in terms of producing excess reactive nitrogen that gets into the environment. And then other, other um, tools that we're going to use is looking at nitrogen use efficiency. And this is being done in a number of different ways around the country, around the world. There, being, there are countrywide NUE budgets. There are farm scale NUE budgets. Um, there are many other ways of looking at nitrogen use efficiency. The second here is developing a methodology. It's actually turning into an encyclopedia, and I'm in charge of this too, I'm sorry to say, um, of methodologies for determining threats and benefits. The document that we've produced, though, is, very, is turning out to be very interesting because we have 
a big section on integrated methodologies. One of those is nitrogen use efficiency. Another is nitrogen footprints. Another is looking at planetary boundaries. So we're presenting all of those as a way that you could look at nitrogen at different scales and determine where we sit in terms of, of damage to a particular region or nationality or globally over, over that. Um, there's several others of these. The one that Roy is involved in and this great team of students and postdocs I met today uh, looking at end valuation. How do you value the threats and the benefits from nitrogen? And it's not just in terms of monetary amounts. It can be services. It can be uh, other, other ways of looking at this. This has been a very dynamic group over there. There's a group that looks at barriers. Why can't we get people to change their behavior or countries to change their behavior? Anyhow, that's what this first pillar is looking at. The others are equally interesting. I'm not telling you about them. But I will tell you about the, um, the first part going back here, national nitrogen budgets, farm budgets, and, and NUE over here. So national nitrogen budgets are being, uh, we determined we're using one specific model. It's called CHANS, Coupled Human and Natural Systems. Um, it was developed by Baojing Gu, who's out of the University of Shanghai. It's essentially a large Excel spreadsheet. And it looks something like this. There are inputs and outputs for each kind of, of nitrogen source. They're all human activity related. There's a separate section for industrial systems. All these human activities are, are the whole breadth of what you can think of in terms of how nitrogen is spread on the environment. There's rangelands. There's croplands. There's um, agricultural activities. There's food production and transport systems. Um, there's human well-being that includes all of your pets because they're not insignificant. Anyhow, it's being used all over the world now as to develop national nitrogen budgets. It's already been done for Australia, for China, for Japan. Um, we're implementing it for the United States. All you have to have is access to an Excel spreadsheet and a whole lot of data. And of course, the quality of this um, budget rests on the quality of the data that you have. I had an undergraduate student who worked with me, and we actually did it for Tibet. So the Tibetan plateau, where the data are extremely sparse, and we did the best we could. But it's still better than nothing. And the value of this and, and the other two methods I'm going to show you in a second is that if you repeat them over time with either better data or um, you develop a time series, you can actually see how you are doing in terms of your system, whatever system that is, in terms of either improving your nitrogen management or showing it go worse. Farm budgets is something else that's being applied by this group. Um, for some reason, they decided dairy farms were going to, were going to be the, the system that they were going to study all over the world. Um, what I learned out of this exercise is that establishing your system bounds is absolutely essential. Because if you can if say, this is what's inside, and I'm going to manage, I'm going to calculate the nitrogen for this particular system, then it becomes much easier to look at inputs and outputs as long as your system boundaries do not change. So the system boundary I thought was unduly constrained for dairy farms, but there it is. We have dairy farms all over the world where they're calculating inputs um, in terms of fertilizer, biological nitrogen <coughs> fixation, atmospheric deposition, and also the food supplies and fertilizer supplies that come in on the side. And then they're calculating outputs. So they can look at the benefits as well as the threats on, um, of, on, on a dairy farm. A couple of other ways that people look at budgets is looking at system but looking at chain and surplus. What's the sequence of nitrogen as it moves through a system to either a product that you benefit from or a waste product that you don't? And also nitrogen footprints. And nitrogen footprints is an idea that took off over the past 10 or 15 years for a system. In this case, mostly it's been universities all over the world where they calculate their nitrogen footprint. So it's how much nitrogen comes in, mostly for food preparation, for students who take advantage of that at a university. But it also includes energy and transportation costs. It includes whether your systems compost or have sewage treatment systems going out the end. Um, I recently saw, and we're doing this at my own university, Colorado State, but we're also do, I also saw a very recent presentation where they're doing it for McGill and another university right across the hill from McGill and comparing the two nitrogen footprints one, McGill is very urban. This other one has a, a more of a suburban population. Very different ways that nitrogen is being used across these systems. And one of the nice things about this is, again, if you do it over time, you could see ways in which nitrogen surpluses could be reduced. Um, in this case of universities, we are going to university administrations and asking for goals. So the University of Virginia has just set a nitrogen reduction goal, 30 by 2030. 
They want to reduce their nitrogen inputs to the university by 30% by 2030. And that's what we're going to try to work for for Colorado State University. So the third um, indicator for farms that I want to mention here is nitrogen use efficiency. And I mention this because we're doing this in our own demonstration project. This is a diagram that was developed by the um, European Union. And on the bottom, on the x-axis, you have nitrogen inputs from low to high. On the y, you have nitrogen outputs, again, from low to high. That white line in the middle, in the two, between the two dashed sets of lines, is the sweet spot where you actually want to be, where in an agricultural system or a national system, you want to be applying only as much nitrogen that will give you the optimal productivity that you're after and no more. Um, is that possible? It's probably not. But you don't want to stray too far in either direction into the yellow system or the orange system. If you go into the yellow system, you have insufficient nitrogen. You start to mine it out of your soil systems. Countries that are food insecure are mining nitrogen out of their soils because they're not applying it as fertilizer. Countries, on the other hand, that are orange have excess nitrogen loss. They're adding too much. Um, this is where you start to get truly large environmental problems over there. So this NUE that we're trying to aim for is, um, is, is that sweet spot in the middle that's white. You could do that at the farm level. You can do that at the demonstration project level, and we are. You can also do it at a country level. And Xinjiang, who's out of the University of Maryland, has done some really interesting thing, look, things looking at NUE over time for countries. And you can see certain patterns as countries um, become more developed and have more access to funds that they can use for fertilizer. They, all, they tip into this level over here. So they sort of have lines that go back and forth over time, depending on where they sit on the curve for NUE, nitrogen use efficiency. Let me apply some of this to our demonstration projects. And first, I want to tell you about all of them, because it's really very interesting. Um, this was a, a, an integral part of the INMS. They were set up all over the world to create, first of all, regional nitrogen assessments, mostly in places where they had not been before, and to improve understanding of regional nitrogen signals, cycles. They um, were trying, not very successfully yet, to design a common methodology. Well, they, we are. I just told you what those are. The end flows. We're using chance at the country level, at the demonstration level, nitrogen use efficiency. And we're also developing in some region, wherever we can in regions, success stories. What works? What were you able to do to reduce the nitrogen loss to these ecosystems? And what are the barriers to change? Many individual landowners are, are reluctant to change their behavior because this is how they've always done it. Many countries are reluctant to adopt policies. So we're trying to figure all of those out and, and figure out ways that we can work together collaboratively from everywhere from the individual farm level up to an international level in a collaborative way to improve nitrogen management. Um, the term that's used, and maybe, maybe this is unusual to you, is joined up nitrogen management. This was new to me. OK, here they are. There are demonstration projects all over the world. And they range in size from the very, very smallest, which is the one in North America. And I'll go into more detail on that in a second, to the very, very largest which is the region includes all of China, Korea, and Japan. So that three is the number of countries involved. Um, it's, it's almost incomprehensible to me, but they're, they're developing budgets, NUEs, barriers to change ex, um, uh, estimates for, for that entire region. Another equally large region is, is what they call South Asia. Five countries there are joined up. It's all of India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh and Nepal. And all five of these are doing their very best to develop nitrogen budgets both separately and together, and again, figure out better ways um, to manage nitrogen. And I should say that India is leading in a great many innovations for how they're going to try to reduce nitrogen excess moving into um, their rivers and their coasts over there. Um, Africa, the whole Lake Victoria catchment is part of this, the La Plata Basin in South America. There's two groups in Western and Eastern Europe. The Eastern European one is Moldova, Ukraine, and some other country. It's the Dnieper River, and another one, the Danube, I think. And that leads us to North America over time. The purpose of these demonstration projects was to look at different levels of nitrogen management across the globe. So you have developing areas with excess nitrogen, South Asia, East Asia, Latin America, you have developing areas that don't have enough nitrogen. They're still food insecure. That's East Africa. 
all of the countries that have watersheds that feed into the Lake Victoria Basin. You have regions with, you have a region with a transition economy, that's the Eastern European one. And then you have developed areas with a whole lot of excess nitrogen, that's us, Western Europe and North America over time. So let me introduce you to the Nooksack Fraser Transboundary Nitrogen Project, which is our actual name for our North American demonstration project. This is the brainchild of a colleague of mine, Shabtai Bittman, who is with Food and Agriculture Canada. He actually lives up in Ab Abbotsford. And, we were, and when we were looking for an international example for North America, you had to cross boundaries. Um, we first considered Lake Erie and we said, oh no, that's way too large. We don't want to tackle that. And, and Shabtai said, well, I have a place. And it happens to be his backyard. So you are sitting up here on the, the, the Canadian state of Washington state line. Um, it's the US and Canada watershed, airshed and aquifer. And the reason this exists is because the whole region is basically a floodplain draining into Bellingham Bay, which is a part of Puget Sound. So the water table is very high, the topography is very flat, and water that, um, and, and nitrogen and phosphorus that are applied in the Canadian side flows as groundwater and surface water across the border and down into the state of Washington. There's a variety of land uses in this region. It's, all, it's nearly all agricultural, at least where the light green area is. Light green is agricultural. Um, here's a teaser down here of what they are. It's, um, it's poultry, it's dairy, it's berries. Most of the berries you eat in North America come from these two places, Whatcom County and, and Abbotsford over there. <clears throat> the darker area is forests, and we actually quantified our budget for forests coming in. It ends up at the top with Mount Rainier National Park, so it's a national park, it's protected as wilderness. There are very strict air quality requirements for there. One of the things that we discovered and we continue to work with over there is the very different policies for managing water pollution that you see between Canada and the US. And this was just fascinating to us and we're just beginning to dip into it in a little bit more to find out whether the policies work in the first place and how we can, if I use Mark Sutton's word, join them up a little bit better so that we can have better collaboration to manage nitrogen over there. We have also tribal and First Nation issues, and this is very interesting. There's a lot of agriculture in this region, but there's also two Native American tribes, the Lumi Nation and the Nooksack tribe. And the Lumi especially, yes, it's the Lumi, um, have historically my, um, harvested shellfish out of Bellingham Bay. So they did this very successfully for decades and decades until about 1970 when the groundwater and surface water contributions of nitrate and also fecal coliforms became so high that they were unable to harvest their shellfish. So they've been without an income for the past 30, 40 years. They're pointing their fingers at the farmers. The farmers in Whatcom County are pointing their fingers at Canada. And they're saying, they're all saying it's your fault. And they're going, no, it's his fault. So one of the reasons we chose this area is because we thought there was enough information, and there is, to develop a, a credible nitrogen budget to show people where it really is coming from. And we thought, oh, great, now that everybody knows where it's coming from, those who are the biggest polluters will say, we'll step up and say, okay, we're gonna change our behavior. Not, um, <laughs> but hope springs eternal and we're a long way from leaving this particular region. The other thing to say is that downstream effects, as I just mentioned, are local. There is groundwater contamination like you would not believe, both on the Canadian and the, and the US side. A lot, about 30% of the people who live in this region get their water from wells. The well water is well above 40 to 50 milligrams of nitrogen per liter, so it's not healthy. The groundwater is a problem. The surface water is highly contaminated with nitrogen, and the estuary is too. So it's a very small watershed. It's like living in a fishbowl. Everybody knows everybody else, and that nitrogen is moving down into the bay. I'm going to give you another way of looking at it in just a second. So here again, you have a, a Google Earth map um, looking down on the region. That's Mount Baker up there. It's one of the stratovolcanoes of that region. That's up at the top. That may not actually be in Mount Rainier National Park. But you can see the country line, British Columbia and Whatcom County. Um, it's a mythical line. I've stepped across it. It's, um, it's just there. Um, if you he heighten out and look at the, the, the watershed itself, you could see, again, that very funny structure for the, for the drainage itself. And part of that is because the groundwater sloshes around in the areas that are agricultural on the, on the western end of that. And the other side, as I mentioned, is forest. If you look at the hydrography, you can see 
um, a whole drainage network of things. But most importantly, almost all the water feeds into this river called the Nooksack River. And it goes down to that little yellow blot there, which is where all the nitrogen is being deposited. So clearly, it's a small area with a big problem. We called them up. I called them up, I have to say. Um, I didn't know anybody in this region. I only knew a couple people by reputation. Hans Schreer, for instance, from University of British Columbia. I called him up. Um, I called up David Hooper, who's at Western Washington University. And I called 40 other people and said, would you like to help develop a nitrogen management program for this particular region? And to my utter amazement, all of these people from all of these organizations jumped in with both feet. That was in 2016. They're still there. They call up on the phone. We have monthly phone meetings. They're invested in trying to find a solution for this. So you can see we have tribes. We have national organizations on, on both sides. We have the, state, the province of British Columbia. We have um, universities involved. It's been, we have lots of state agencies and municipalities. And maybe our most important partner has been the local conservation district. So this is a group of, of the most professional practitioners I've ever seen. They have PhDs in agriculture. They have lawyers. They know every farmer in the region. And they've been absolutely invail invaluable in telling us how to approach them. Because you can't just walk into some farmer and say, let's fix what you're doing. So you, we've been working with them to learn the appropriate language, the um, times of the year when it's right to meet with them. It's been absolutely incredible. And the overall question that everyone buys into is how can we work together to re reduce loss to the environment? And, and one of the very, if, if we walked away today, one of the benefits we've had is that there have been no lawsuits since we started to work there. Um, the, the tribes were suing the farmers. The farmers were, were um, threatening to sue somebody else. They have stopped that. They said, let's try to work together first. So we, we call this, it's the nooksack Fraser transboundary nitrogen. I'm sorry, it's such a mouthful. But the scope and goals of Nifty N, that we call for, are, are threefold. Um, one is to develop a nitrogen budget that is, that is approved of and agreed upon by all. So one common tactic I've found in many years, and you probably have too, is that it's very easy to poke at the data if, if one group agrees with it and some, else, some other group doesn't. And they go, well, it's not our problem because those data are faulty. And we have tried very hard to prevent that by working incredibly closely with everyone who provides the data, and the growers, and the dairy farmers, and the berry farmers, and the poultry farmers. And, and every time that comes up with a number, we go back to them and say, what do you think about this? This is how I got it. So it's completely transparent. These budgets are developed with everyone looking over their shoulder. Um, the, the mastermind behind the nitrogen budget is a postdoctoral fellow, Jia Jia Lin, who's absolutely phenomenal. She had incredible patience because she could have done this with existing data from the US Geological Survey and the state of Washington in about a month. But it took her more than a year and a half in order to get buy-in from everyone who was producing a number. And it came down to as many small things as one of the guys from the conservation district going, you know, you have nitrogen coming from that hay field here, and I don't think that number's right. You know, and she would have to go back and spatially attribute um, and, and, and go back and forth until there was agreement on that. So our nitrogen inventory is actually done. It's in review in JGR Biogeosciences. Um, we've done that iteratively with citizen input all the way through. We're now going to work in rolling out this nitrogen budget and moving to our next step, which is how do we collaborate? How can we adopt even more best management practices than they already practice? Um, we want to look at constraints and opportunities. What are the success stories? And we have quite a few of those in the region. This is not a group of farmers who are are ignorant of what it takes in order to manage their nitrogen, but they also have to make a living. We want that to happen. We want to achieve the environmental goals. We also want to maintain these vibrant economies, and in, in the case of the Lummi, bring that back, and, and also respect diverse cultural values. So that's been a huge challenge. I would say we're still at the beginning of that particular effort. But our budget, here's a wiring diagram. It looks like every other wiring diagram you've ever seen. We establish the system bounds. And the system bounds was the entire watershed going up to Mount Baker and Mount Rainier and down to Bellingham Bay at the outlet of the Nooksack River. Um, the inputs are in orange, and they're just as you'd expect. Um, there's the atmosphere. There's food that's imported for people who live there. So Abbotsford is a big city, biggish city. Um, Bellingham is a biggish city. There's a number of other littler cities 
in there and, and villages, farming villages over there. There's also an input from biological nitrogen fixation. There's food that's imported in the agricultural sector down here. Um, this is a large part of the input for both livestock and poultry, dairy and poultry. There's also um, fertilizer inputs for the crops that are grown. These crops are mostly fed, well, the hay and the pasture lands are fed to the livestock, especially the, the dairy cows. Um, the berries are, are their own, and they have um, inputs of fertilizer coming in. There's also biological nitrogen fixation that's added because for some reason they grow leguminous cover crops in this particular region. So those are our major inputs. Atmospheric deposition is coming in. Atmospheric deposition is not insignificant because this area is just east of the city of Vancouver. So it's got quite a lot of, of urban sources coming in. Outputs, on the other hand, are, are again what you think of. There's crop exports, there's animal product exports, there's groundwater exports. Oh, and I didn't mention the salmon. There's a small salmon run coming up this river and down this river. And then there's exports to Bellingham Bay, the pollution in the air and surface, and the, the pollution in the grounds and surface water and bay into the coast. So our flows look like this. And let me talk you through this because um, it makes it easier if I, if I do. I want you first to look at the blue bars. And you have inputs on the left. You have watershed processes in the two middle bars. And you have outputs on the right in the blue bar. And they're proportional to the amount of material nitrogen coming in from these different systems. So if you look at, at the left side here, feed imports is by far the largest input of nitrogen to this basin. It's not a closed circle. It's not um, self-sustaining. They're importing a huge amount of nitrogen in to feed their dairy and poultry. And if you look at the next box, you can see it's about equally distributed between the dairy on the south and poultry on the north. Did I say that? The Canadians grow chickens. The, the Washington staters grow dairy cows. So feed imports is coming in. If you continue down and look at your inputs, um, it's about equally distributed between fertilizer imports for the crops that they're growing, human food imports for the cities, um, things that are not growing within the basin, and then atmospheric deposition, as I mentioned, coming in mostly from Vancouver area over there. It goes into this watershed, it gets mixed around, um, and as you look at outputs, about a third of it is coming up as ammonia emission. So that manure is coming off of urine patches and manure from the dairy cows. About another equal third is animal products. That's the good stuff that you want to produce that's going up. There's a little bit of crop exports. Those are, again, the dairy. But they don't have very much nitrogen, um, so it's not very large. There's some denitrification. But at the products, the good stuff in animal products, is about equal to what's being exported in the river. And about 20% of it, and we say 20% because we only can quantify the US side of it, is groundwater nitrogen retention. So some of that is coming in from Canada. We don't know how much. That's our next task, is to try to estimate that. But there's a, uh, there's a huge amount of nitrogen in the groundwater moving at some rate unknown, probably into the bay over time. So the take home messages from that diagram is that the largest input of, the largest import is feed for animals. Um, fertilizer is about equal to what we import for human food. Um, Ammonia emissions and animal product exports and river exports are about equal at 30%. And some very significant part, 20% at least, is, is retained in the watershed as groundwater coming in. We then looked at how it differed between countries, because we have two countries here, we have the US and Canada. So Canada is uh, red and the US is blue. And, and really, there isn't a whole lot to see on here, except if you look at feed imports, and you just saw this on the diagram I just showed you. Feed imports for poultry on the Canadian side is enormous. It's going in to feed all those chickens that are sold on contract to the city of Vancouver or to restaurants within Vancouver. This is a very different way of doing business than south of the border, where it's basically sold to the highest bidder. Um, these are contracted. You probably know way more about this than I do. In Canada, it's, it's not profit is everything, um, which is a good thing. So you've got a lot of input for dairy on the US side, um, feed to go there, a lot of input for poultry. And, and most of the rest of this is US types of inputs. Atmospheric deposition, but it's not necessarily our deposition, our emissions that are causing that deposition. It's, it's Vancouver emissions. You've got about an equal amount of coming in inputs as food for humans and pets, if you remember pets. Um, you have crop, some crop import. 
you have feed import for other animals. There are horses in, in this region as well. That's the input. On the output side, we have a lot of volatilization. That's the ammonia that's going up and out. That's on the US side, again, from our dairy operations. Not so much coming in from Canada. Um, about equal amounts of products of animal export over time. So this is where we sit within our particular demonstration region, where, as I mentioned, this particular paper is going through review right now, but we're far from done with what we want to do. We want to, um, we, have, we have the published nitrogen budget. We're happy to say that. We're beginning to develop calculations for nitrogen use efficiency. We're doing this by sector. We're doing it at the farm gate, but also in municipalities, for the berry farms, for the poultry farms, so that over time we can see whether it's being improved or not with different types of management practices. We're gathering success stories so that we can show that some farmers and some groups of farmers are actually making a difference. And there are some. I, we have toured some dairy farms in, on, the, on the US side where they have um, giant containers where they collect their slurry of manure over the winter because it's too wet. It's a rainforest up there, and it rains all winter long. So they collect manure all winter long. It gets piped to a central facility in Whatcom County where they have a digester. They pull off the methane and use it for fuel. And they also, I believe, are pulling off the nitrate and nitrogen and the phosphorus for reuse somewhere. So that's a great solution if we could implement that on a larger scale than a few select farmers doing that kind of thing. I don't think it's economically feasible yet. This was funded by the Gates Foundation as an experiment. But it's something that we can use as one of the ways to go to reduce nitrogen, where so much of it is imported into this region, so it's being exported into the bay. We need to find some other way of getting it out of there that isn't um, prohibitively expensive. The other thing we're doing is we're running scenarios with these global scale models and, and the chance model that we will be applying to say, what would it take to reduce nitrogen. So 30% is possibly a plausible goal. That's what the University of Virginia is doing. 50% um, is what the UN declaration I'm going to show you in just a second is, is what the implausible goal is. But what would it actually take? Remember, you want to keep people's livelihoods. You don't want to put anyone out of business. You want to um, protect the environment all at once. Could you actually do that by dropping your nitrogen inputs by half, as well as your nitrogen losses. So we're doing that for INMS, this International Nitrogen Management System. We're required within the next eight months to have papers written, presentations prepared. But we're not going to walk away at the end of this project. Um, even though it ends in another year, this region requires, um, is so invested in trying to improve their nitrogen management that we think that it will be um, a collaboration that will last over the next several of decades. And of course, I think it has to. If you talk about nitrogen uh, management, these are enduring problems that we have set up for ourselves as an industrial and developed society. They're not going to be changed overnight. So you actually have to invest as a scientist in the long haul with these communities to, to work with them and build their trust and, and try to, to enact change incrementally instead of catastrophically. So one of the things we've started to do is a policy review. Um, one of the reasons we started here is because we were told that the policies between Canada and the US were so very different. And yes, indeed, they are, or at least they were until December of 1919, or 2019. Um, so we started by assessing what are the policies and where are they implemented. Down the road, what we hope to do is look at how effective are these policies and how could they be more effective. Um, and to do that, we'll be going to the ranchers and dairy farmers and poultry farmers themselves and saying, you know, you have these rules and regulations, do they work? And if not, what would make them more effective over time? So we're trying to look at solutions. We're trying to develop scenarios. Um, we're looking at costs and synergies, all of those things that we're doing this collectively with the conservation district, with the dairy farmers. We've had less luck actually integrating with the poultry farmers, which is a very interesting group of people. They are very tight-knit. They came over from India as a group. They're a group of Sikhs, and they live together, and they grow poultry. And so they have been harder to approach, um, but we're working on that. And then we hope to develop consensus recommendations. That's going to take many, many years, and we're starting group by group by group in order to try to divide and conquer, as you will. So we did this comparison of policies across the Canada and the US. Um, Canada's on the left. Is that left? Yes, Canada's on the left. The US is on the right. 
They're different size pies because there are more policies, a lot more policies on the US side. Do they work? I don't know. Some of them do, of course, but, but not necessarily all of them. They're color coded. So um, international policies, these are treaties, like the Convention on Biodiversity or the Long Range Transport of Air Pollutants. Those are orange. Um, national policies, national scale policies, such as Canadian or US wide, are red. There's only four of those on the US side. There's four, or four of those on the Canadian side. There's 14 on the US side, mostly coming from the Environmental Protection Agency. There's British Columbia-wide policies, or in our case, the state of Washington. Those are blue. Um, there's more of those on your side. There's more provincial policies. And then the Fraser Valley, if you move down to the local area or the Whatcom area, there's a few policies over there. So we started, well, this is as far as we've gotten here with the policies, and we were going to start looking at how effective they actually were when something really, truly wonderful happened with the province of British Columbia. So in 2019, they implemented a code of practice for agricultural environmental management. Do you all know about this? Okay, this was so exciting because it was the, the province stepping up and saying, we have a, a water quality problem and we're going to try to save it, uh, solve it. So they have these new policies, they're outcome-based, they're risk-based, so they're specific to the regions that pose the greatest problems, they're science-based, and they have a regional approach. Um, it begins to make British Columbia regulation look a lot more comparable to those of Whatcom County and the state of Washington. And we'll only have to see, but I'm excited to start working with the province to see how we can help them develop these policies that will be more effective. I want to finish by coming back to this fourth box, which is the awareness raising and knowledge sharing. And we're still at the beginning of this. Yes, there's going to be books and proceedings and publishable papers. But what we really wanted to do, and I will say the, the investors in IMS, was to make a big difference at a global scale. So as of just last October, um, the, the, um, Sri Lanka stood up, stood up and held a, um, developed something called the Colombo Declaration. And there's 110 countries that have signed off on this. And it basically says nitrogen is a huge international issue, and we are going to undertake a challenge of trying to have nitrogen waste, cut it in half, by the year 2030, 2030, not 2020. Um, this is a big goal, but it's now being touted by the United Nations, and a number of countries have said, we'll try to take that challenge. That's very exciting. And none of it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had this huge international concerted effort over time. So this is my second to the last slide here, and it talks about where nitrogen can actually fit in all of the international arena. So INMS is down here on the bottom. We've developed something called an interconvention nitrogen coordination mechanism. And what it talks about is providing the scientific foundation for how nitrogen interacts with all the existing treaties that, that, are, that the UN supports. The UN, convention, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, the Montreal Protocols, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Global Protection Act for, for Marine Systems, and the Long Range Transport and Air Pollution. So it's a place where we're finding ourselves in the middle um, where we can actually have an input. And just as an aside, I don't know if you've ever noticed that sustainable development goals don't mention nitrogen at all. So this is a place where we're trying to insert ourselves in terms of international policy by providing a scientific foundation to better man manage nitrogen around the globe. And with that, I want to thank you and thank my great team from the NIPSEC. Questions? Uh, hello, uh, thank you for a nice presentation. So I've got one quick question, like uh, we saw that in 20th century, the, uh, there's increasing trend of nitrogen use, and we saw uh, Colombo declaration that we have to reduce the uh, waste of nitrogen by half. So have you uh, ever thought of uh, studying biochar, because biochar, uh, it's used in agricultural field and it can reduce the use of nitrogen by maybe 20%, 30%, or 50% because of its porous nature and uh, enhancement in microbial activity. And it, it, in fact, increases the crop yield also. So it's one of the best things uh, I have heard uh, because agriculture is done all over the world. 
and it can be taken in a very large scale. Mm -hmm. So I would like, like to have your comment on biochar application for curbing nitrogen. I, I think there's a lot of promise in biochar. I think it's one of the many tools that need to be applied. I don't know enough about it to know whether it's ready to be applied on a very large scale. But certainly anything we could do to keep nitrogen, I have a colleague, Mary Power from Berkeley, who says you want to keep nitrogen as high up in the watershed as you possibly can. And if biochar is one way that you could actually do that in agricultural regions, it's something we should certainly consider. Because this reduces eutrophication also. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and builds up soil organic matter of some kind. Yeah. I don't know about char. Thank you, Jill, for a really interesting talk. Uh, with the RNMS, is there any uh, work on uh, looking at, so the, most of the budgets you were talking about were uh, agricultural and inputs, uh, about with trends in concentrations in aquifers or in streams, and whether that has been increasing or decreasing and um, linking it? So, so thank you, because I forgot to mention that, that among the reasons that we have been successful in this region so far, to the extent that we are, is that we didn't only look at agricultural budgets. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, a lot of the farmers said, well, it's municipalities. So we quantified their sewage, their food inputs, their food waste, their sewage outputs. Um, we have all of those numbers. And to the extent that the other demonstration projects can do that too, they certainly are. The trends that we've seen over time with groundwater are, are um, are variable, and, there's, and, and what, we're, what we've learned over this kind of research, and a lot of people are helping do that, is that in this particular region, you actually see surges in nitrogen groundwater, nitrogen groundwater in groundwater when they change the canes that grow the berries. So it's a five-year cycle. They grow blueberries on, on um, a, a scaffolding or, or raspberries or strawberries, and every five years, they whip out all those canes and put in fresh ones. And as soon as they do that, there's no root structure left. All that nitrogen goes into the groundwater. That's very cool. So we're not necessarily seeing a trend in any direction, so, so much as we're seeing sort of a cyclical trend related to agricultural practices. But that gives us a point where we could start to look at possible solutions. Maybe they don't have to rip out entire fields at once. Maybe they could stagger. Right, you know? right, right. Really cool. And you could actually use that rise to estimate groundwater nitrate recharge. We could. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, okay. because the big unknown here is how fast it's moving. And, right. Uh, I keep asking that question. They go, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the great talk. So I, I want to also ask about the groundwater. Um, you mentioned that for many communities, they are suffering from not being able to or, or the groundwater is, is over at least a health threshold for, for nitrate. I'm wondering if you analyzed which communities are affected, and if, if specifically you're saying that this, this groundwater problem is something you're gonna, going to address in the future, is that one, one of the key targets, you would say, for the group as kind of an anthropocentric goal to, to say people should have clean water? Or is it kind of nested among people with values for the river itself and those sorts of things? It's certainly the latter. It's certainly nested. So when we hold meetings, and we've only been able to afford to hold three or four of these um, region-wide, region, you know, it's a small region, we get the environmental groups who come in and they're really only concerned about surface water quality and, and salmon or, or forest productivity and, and birds. And then we get the farmers and we get the municipalities who um, to this day have sort of said, well, this is the cost of doing agriculture in this region. We're going to have bad water which of course is not necessarily true. But all of those groups come together and they all have different interests. And I mentioned the tribes before, certainly the Lumi who are in the Bay trying to make a living. They have an interest that's economic more than anything else. So it's a whole group of interests. And one of the reasons we're, we're working now, beginning to work group by group, is to find sort of uh, commonalities in, say, the dairy farmers where they all agree on, say, a course of action and maybe a path over a series of years where they're going to try it. Um, I ha we haven't gotten there yet in the Nooksack, but I work in, I'm from Colorado, so I'm, I'm a carpetbagger there too. I don't know these people. But in Colorado, I'm working with a number of dairy farmers and feedlot owners, and we actually have gotten them over the past eight or nine years to agree on certain best management practices that they weren't doing before. 
And now it remains to us to quantify whether there's a response or not. So we're going to try to do that piece by piece over here over who knows how many years, as long as they'll let us stay there. And a lot of the people who work with me, a lot of these people actually live in the basin. So they're way more invested in it than I am. And they're going to see whether they can get all these different groups to come together in order to improve nitrogen. Oh, no, 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 that's not what I intended. <laughs> so um, we make these sweeping statements about sub-Saharan Africa, which of course is, is, a, is something we should not be doing. So Lake Victoria is actually having tremendous amounts of eutrophication because it's getting um, inputs of agricultural effluent as well as urban and municipal effluent, atmospheric deposition. These particular, this particular lake is becoming eutrophic due to nitrogen inputs over there. It's not that we do nothing about it. Um, I, I think a large solution is to be working, is, is having Africans add the right amount of nitrogen. You have the opportunity to do it right instead of adding too much nitrogen and then having to back off because there's a problem. So many of the, the regional agricultural experts we're working with, and again, I am not one of those, um, are trying to work with farmers to say, um, you need this kind of, of in, inorganic nitrogen fertilizer and phosphorus in order to get these kinds of yields. And it's also water related as well. So it's beginning, you know, if we in, in, our, in the United States could start over, presumably we wouldn't have poured nitrogen onto these systems to the extent that we could, knowing what we do today. So the approach there has been to try to be more careful as, as agriculture develops in sub-Saharan Africa. Does that make sense? And, and I should apologize, because we do make these blanket statements, and, and they shouldn't be made. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have to stop here. So Jill will be around in the morning, too, and we have more people for the community. We want to meet her in person, and we'll have to do. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you, Thank you all.